Mandy Harvey is an American deaf singer-songwriter. She was a vocal music education major at Colorado State University when she lost her residual hearing at the age of 18 due to a connective tissue disorder called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. However, her Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome did not stop her from pursuing her dreams and aspirations. Mandy now is a successful singer-songwriter who is well-known uh, for Simon Cowell's Golden Buzzer winner on America's Got Talent. She also has performed at a variety of different uh, nightclubs, festivals, and events. She performed and was our guest speaker at the Different Enable launch event. Mandy recently launched her memoir, Sensing the Rhythm, Finding My Voice in a World Without Sound, in which she encourages people to reach their dreams and aspirations. Uh, Mandy also is an ambassador to uh, No Barriers uh, USA, uh, and often goes around and gives inspirational talks on her difference and celebrating differences and disabilities. Uh, Mandy's uh, motto is always remember to try. We are so honored and welcome Mandy today to be speaking with us. So can you tell us a little bit about your Ehlers Danlos syndrome? Yeah, so I started having um, issues physically when I was a young child. I've always been the kid who like stood and my knees bent back in weird ways. And it's, it's been something that we were aware because hypermobility is very um, common in my family, but we didn't have a label for it. Um, I have it infected in all of my joints and ligaments. Everything is hypermobile. So they move and dislocate very easily. And when I was a senior in high school, I dislocated my leg walking in PE class. And that started a cycle of five or six major surgeries within a year and a half. And my body's reaction to the stress and the medication and my body changing being 18 years old were all kind of the perfect storm that caused uh, my hearing loss and a great deal of vision loss as well. Oh, wow. Yeah. I didn't realize how, I didn't realize how complicated it was. Uh, it's, you know, I think that every person's experience is very different. That's why we're called zebras, because everybody's stripes are a little bit different, but also your body kind of tears in certain ways. Um, I think every day I learn something new. <laughs> it's amazing to see and watch. Well, thank you. I've had a lot of amazing people encourage me the whole way, so... Um, I wouldn't want to let myself down, but I wouldn't want to let any of them down either. Right. Yeah, you have a great support system, aside from your family, of course. So, um, again, it's wonderful to see. So, as so, did you always know that you wanted to be a singer-songwriter uh, before <laughs> your diagnosis? No. Um, I wanted to be a music teacher to my whole heart, I never saw myself as a performer. And the idea of writing music, I always thought that people were just born natural, like songwriters that it just dumped out of them. Um, so I didn't feel like I naturally had that gift. So I never tried. And then after I lost my hearing and I lost this opportunity for what I saw as being a teacher, I, found a way back into music and it just happened to be connected with performance. And so that kind of led to performing. And then I was encouraged to start songwriting by a friend of mine who is named Eric Weinmeier. He's the first blind man to climb Mount Everest. There's been two, if you can believe that is amazing. Wow. He's amazing, but he just asked me straightforward. He says, why haven't you written of your own songs? And I said, well, that's terrifying. It's weird enough to sing a song that other people know and said is a good song. It's way different to sing a song that no one has ever heard before. That's a huge like risk, putting yourself out there in a huge way. And he said, what's the worst that can happen? And I didn't have an answer. And so it 
kind of challenged me to start thinking about this idea of what's the worst that can happen. And then eventually I got to a point where I got tired of focusing on the negative, uh, on the, on the negative and I wanted to focus on the positive. So I started to say, well, what's the best that can happen? You know, what's the best that can happen by writing a song? Maybe I give words to somebody else who is going through a difficult time or just words to an emotion and we can be connected like a community. What's the best that can happen by putting myself out there? Maybe it will encourage somebody else to chase their dream. Get over myself. Let's go. So that's how your uh, singing and songwriting started. Yeah. So with your diagnosis, how do you write and play music? So now everything is based from feeling the vibrations as well as using visual tuners. So I use apps on my phone where I can see what I'm singing or what is being played. And then I connect that with how it feels. Uh, in addition, um, a lot of music theory. The difficulty with having EDS and having a skill set that is connected to feeling vibrations is that I lose feeling in my body a lot. So I've cultivated a skill and my body decides if it's gonna work or not that day for me to be able to really like harness it and feel good about it. So I don't write um, when I'm feeling that miserable. I might journal, but I don't necessarily worry too much about, oh, I need to write a song today, you know? Right. And um, how often are you uh, songwriting uh, and, and playing? I mean, obviously. I work, yeah, I work on my music every day, um, except when I'm like really, really sick. But I work on music every day. I work on speech therapy and speaking clearly every single day. I work on um, some kind of physical activity because I have uh, bad blood flow and that creates the numbness all over my body. And to keep myself alive, I have to do a lot of physical therapy. Um, so I have many things in my life that are just a part of my norm. I've, I've stitched it into my life. Yeah. You know, what's so interesting is that, uh, you know, people that know you, including myself, know that, you know, you have Elo's Danlos syndrome uh, and you know, you're an amazing singer, songwriter and so forth. But you just telling me about the speech therapy, the physical therapy that you do on the side. I don't think anyone would even think about that uh, because you're, you know, you're so proficient and you're just, you know, you appear amazing, so. Well, thank you. I, that's, that's one of the biggest barriers that people have with invisible disabilities is that if you look one way, there's an automatic judgment that happens. And in truth, we have no idea what is going on in other people's lives. You know, you have gone through so many struggles and in your life. And I know as, as hard as it is, there are going to be beautifully awesome days where you just feel amazing and there are going to be difficult days where you don't feel amazing. But because you are such a glowing personality and very smiley, people don't necessarily think about you on your dark days. So it's like they see you on the good days. So that's, that's the only thing that they know of you. But if they could only peek into your life of, waking up in the morning and having to make the decision of whether or not you were going to get out of bed and struggle for the day. Um, you know, if they could hold your hand during all of the physical therapy that you've done with surgeries, if they could have been there through the days where you just want to cry because you just want to wake up normal for one day, just one day, I just want to feel like everybody else. Um, you know, we need to find ourselves in a world where we judge each other so much less and we just love and encourage each other. I, I totally agree. So when you have these really dark days, uh, who do you look to for support? I 
I would assume your parents, of course, you're mm -hmm. married, so your husband as well. Um, mm -hmm. But is there anyone else that, you know, you go to? I, I really, I find a lot of encouragement from people who are going through their own lives. So I talk to a lot of people, whether it's friends or family, everybody understands struggle. So, you know, like you have those people in your life who just kind of kick you in the butt. I have some really incredible friends who have overcome unbelievable obstacles and they just, they find joy in the process, not every day, but on their, their own days where they need somebody to lean on, you know, like we lean on each other. So, um, you know, my down day might not be his down day or her down day and we kind of help build each other up or sometimes we all have it at the same time. We just cry together. You know, it's, it's finding a core group of people who are hundred percent real. And I think that is a challenge far more than my EDS. I would agree. And it's, and, that, and that's a challenge for everyone, regardless of whether you have a difference or not. Yeah. Um, but having a great support system, especially um, when you do have a difference or a disorder, um, yeah. it's great. So what has been your greatest obstacle to date or what is your greatest obstacle that you need to manage on a daily basis? Um, I think trusting myself is, is been one that is a consistent struggle. That's one of the core messages in my song, Try, is that I am so afraid of failure and so afraid of messing up that I don't allow myself to go through the process because I'm afraid of feeling the pain. And what that does is it basically limits you from experiencing life. Um, you have to be willing to fail to be successful in anything. And so telling myself that it doesn't matter if I fail or succeed, I'm going to learn and grow from the experience and uh, find a way to move forward and do better the next time. It, it's, it's a constant struggle and one that as I go through it and as I struggle with it and I see the benefits more and more, I get more courageous. And so now I feel like I'm, I keep doubling down on myself. It's like, oh yeah, all right, you, you've done here. Let's go here. Oh, you're comfortable here? All right, let's go here. So I keep pushing myself. Yeah. And that's, that's a lot. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, I think we all, we all learn on a day-to-day -day basis and it just makes us better and better as uh, human beings. Yeah, um, but I think, I think because there's, there's two different things that's a struggle the most. It's like, one, the world tells you what your, your capabilities are. They limit you. They try to put you in a small box of possibilities. But the real issue is you allowing them to do that because they don't know you worth being. So it's like, you can be anything, you know yourself, they don't know you. But if you allow these other voices to dictate who you are and just play it safe, that's all you're ever gonna be. It's true, those are great words. Yeah. So many people know you uh, for your appearance on America's Got Talent, uh, and you do were Simon Cowell's uh, uh, golden um, buzzer winner. Yeah. What did it uh, feel in that moment? Uh, when you were and you knew it was weird um <laughs> i i had only ever seen the show with like youtube videos like i had never had like cable tv and and like sat and watched it um from top to bottom so i understood very vaguely what a golden buzzer was but i really didn't understand what a golden buzzer was and um I just remember in that moment, the entire stage just shaking and all of this confetti coming down from the sky. And it was just overwhelming because I wanted people to have some moment of positivity, some moment of encouragement, whether or not I got a golden buzzer or not, whether or not I got X off or not, my goal was to encourage one person. And when that happened, it was a, 
you know, it, it, it proved in my heart that not only did I make an impact, but I did something really beautifully positive. And I was very, I was very proud and, and shocked of myself. Yeah, and I mean, and especially because, I mean, you're so unique, like we've gone back to, uh, because you're, uh, you have hearing loss. Uh, mm-hmm. And so to make an accomplish, like, accomplishment like that is just remarkable. You know, it's interesting yeah. because there's a lot of people on America's Got Talent that have some type of uh, disorder. Uh, so actually, it's interesting. I'd love to know, uh, you know, as being one person, how do you, um, you know, look at America's Got Talent now, knowing that there's so many other people that have their own set of disorders or differences um, also on America's Got Talent. Like, it just yeah. wasn't you. Uh, yeah, I think, um, well, one, I, I think that there's a lot of people in the world, a lot of people who have their own barriers. They all look different and they all experience life differently, but I mean, not every person who's going to be on a competition show should be a hundred percent exactly cookie cutter the same. And um, people who put themselves out there, you know, for doing something like that show, I would hope, and in my heart, I do believe that it's not because you're broken and they can talk about it and they can make a story about it. I, that they they genuinely wanted to highlight people who have talent. They just happen to be blind or happen to be autistic or happen to be whatever. Just like that person happens to be German and that person happens to be from Iowa, you know? Um, it shouldn't matter. And my my hope and my goal with being on the show was not to use my disability as some kind of a pity story because I work way too hard to be a pity story. If you could only see my life uh, for one day, you would understand how hard I work and you would know that I don't pity myself at all. So I don't, I don't allow you to, I'm not giving you that opportunity. Right. No, of course, you rise to the occasion regardless. I mean, me too. And I know a lot of people who do. (laughs) Exactly. You talk a lot about um, community and how important it is to you. Can you give us some examples of how community has impacted um, your life and career? Um, You know, for me, when I was losing my hearing, I think that that was probably a huge milestone for me as a person, um, not because um, that was the hardest thing that I've dealt with, but because at when it happened, I was 18, 19 years old, and my entire life up to that point had been my dream of being a music major was my identity. Um, when I lost that dream, I lost my identity, and I lost kind of this idea of who I was completely. So I was kind of, for lack of better words, just completely lost. With having people in my life, whether that was my family or my friends, I had this core group of people who refused to give up on me. And even when I was mean, and even when I was pissed off or just overwhelmed and sad, they didn't leave, they didn't give up. And I would love to say that I never lost friends through the process. That's just not true. But the, the people who really, really mattered, they encouraged me to find value in myself outside of that one dream. And it opened up my scope to learning to love myself for who I was, not just one skill that I was capable of doing, just who I was as a person. The community of encouragement, you know, led me and pushed me outside of my comfort zone and to doing things that I never dreamed of doing, like singing in front of people, (laughs) writing music, having my own concerts, touring around the world, 
trying out for a national television show, making one, two, three, four albums. You know, that wasn't my idea. Those were ideas and encouragement from a lot of different people who were trying to shower me with love. It's true. I mean, I can so relate to you in a lot of different ways uh, with my struggles. You know, it wasn't until actually I got to college that I really um, formed a core group of friends. I've always had support of, of you know, family friends and my parents. But it was, again, when I got to college that I formed a really core group of friends who honestly did not care, quote unquote, of my disability or of my difference. And it's to this day, sometimes, you know, I, you know, I kind of blame, quote unquote, my disability for certain things that I can't do. And people will come up to me, my friends, and will say, no, I don't think that's it. I think you're being too hard on yourself. So um, I, I know what it's, you know, I know what yeah. it's to have, you know, your friends and community really support you and, um, you know, encourage you. Yeah, and to know that you're not alone through your struggle, because every one of those people in your community, every one of those people who you know is struggling on their own right, and for all of us to have this understanding that no matter what happens, I'm not going through this alone, it changes so much about you believing in yourself that you will get better and putting in the work to make that true. Sure. Now that performances are postponed due to this um, lovely pandemic, not lovely, but um, <laughs> this pandemic that we're in, uh, you know, your life as a performer, uh, you know, has changed. Um, can you talk a little bit about how uh, uh, you're, you've had to adapt um, because of uh, COVID-19 and uh, no, how, how are your virtual concerts nowadays? Yeah, I mean, it, it was wild. My last performance was in Canada um, for Girls Inc. Um, in Alberta. And that was like March 10th or something around there. And then I traveled home the next morning and then that next morning I was with my dad. We were at basically an empty airport coming home and we're like, huh, that's weird. Maybe it's just because it's a small airport, you know, like we saw some of the things on the news and we were watching it, but it really hadn't full blown hit. And then when we got home, it wasn't within, you know, 12 hours that everything shut down. So, uh, we, I, I, I mean, there was a period of two days where I got emailed and messaged from basically everybody for all of my performances from March through like January of next year being canceled or moved to the next year. And I was like, well, what am I going to do? You know, it's not it's not the feeling of what am I going to do necessarily for, for money. And, you know, like that's, that's a scary part of the reality that I'm in because that is a great deal of my income, but more, I feel this overwhelming responsibility to be there for people. And when I was there in person at these concerts or speaking or going to schools and seeing these students, I always had the ability to hug people and just be there in person and be an encouragement in person. And it's meant so much to them and to me that that feeling of togetherness is the reason why this is my career. And now that that's gone, I'm trying to figure out ways to quasi do that virtually it's just not the same however i'm i'm trying to be innovative and do my best so i've been doing facebook live concerts and youtube and instagram and um, i'm going to be doing more zoom concerts so there'll be private concerts with like a limited cap for the room that people can get tickets for 
that will be free, but it's just to hold their place. Um, just so that I can, we can see each other and we can have somewhat of, of a connection again. It's, it's been hard and I don't know what the solutions are going to be long term. No one knows, technically. No. <laughs> Unfortunately, Dr. Anthony Fauci, I think he, he has, you know, the most wisdom and insight. But no, I mean, no one really knows until there's a vaccine and so forth. Yeah. So you have done a few virtual concerts and uh, different types of um, performances, uh, again, virtually. How, uh, how have they been? What have been the positives? What have been the negatives? And how does... So your virtual concerts, have, how have they involved inclusion? Yeah, I, I think that has been like the biggest part of, of the virtual concerts. So I noticed right out of the get-go, there were so many artists who were having kind of like virtual concerts or whatever, like these little things that would pop and it would be so cool. You're like, what? Lady Gaga's gonna sing live for everyone? Oh my gosh. But there were never captions. There was never sign language. There was never anything that I could be a part of. And that really frustrated me. So for my first virtual concert, I uh, partnered with Boya Financial and I had me and sign language interpreter Amber Galloway next to each other. And then I made sure that it was captioned on the bottom. So it was inclusive in two different formats. And then I was like, well, that should be the norm. Unfortunately, technology doesn't allow for automatic captions for seeing. Like right now we're having a conversation over Zoom, but Zoom has captioning. Um, available for speaking so I can see what you're speaking and I can see you so I can lip read and kind of match things together with music it doesn't understand so it doesn't caption anything so an entire group of people are being completely left out that was one of the biggest reasons why I started my patreon account is I wanted to put up little mini concerts every Friday that were always captioned so that I could be inclusive to hard of hearing and deaf people so that they had somebody not, you know, maybe that would start a trend. And I've been encouraging other groups to post with captions for their own things. And, and hopefully that will become an industry standard. Yeah. Cause I mean, life unfortunately has changed and even though, you know, there will be a vaccine and life will resume to live performances for you and so forth. I think, you know, across the board, um, you know, there's going to be new standards for um, yes. life and, you know, Zoom and other virtual events um, are going to be more of a regular, okay. you know, normal piece. Um, sure. But even in my live concerts, I always had an interpreter as well anyway. And in some places, an interpreter and cart you know for captioning so it's been something that's been a priority for me since I started performing and um, I would hope that if we're in this time of innovation and change that we can make some really beautiful positive changes that stick one of those things being access we need to allow people to be a part of the world not just only if for the exclusive people who seem to function on one plane. I, I don't think that there's any sense of anybody being normal, um, but we need to find ourselves opening our lives up and being inclusive. If there's been one glowing cry that has happened during COVID is that we are tired of being disconnected and people want to belong and they want to be included. And so it's like, they keep crying for it. Let's do it already. It's 2020. Allow this to be a positive moment in the middle of a crap fest <laughs> that we can do something good this year. Absolutely. You got to make the best out of it. Um, yeah. 
and you know I, I'm from New York so you know like Governor Cuomo always says you know although life is going to change it's it's you know it's positive in many ways and it's important to uh, recognize that for sure yeah personally with um, COVID uh, I'm sure there's been a lot of different things that you've needed to uh, adapt uh, from um, your uh, EDS um, specifically, you know, you talk about how often you use lip reading as a way to um, understand in addition to captions what the other person is talking um, about and, you know, with face masks that <laughs> is very difficult. Uh, so how have you adapted, you know, what again have been some of like the positives and um, negative challenges? I think um, positives is that I've had a lot of support and people who are very understanding. Um, I, I recently did a, a project that I can't talk about quite yet, but everybody had clear face masks for me, as well as I had an interpreting and stuff like that, all with social distancing and, and, and space. But it's been, it's been very tough. You know, you're going to the grocery store and all of these people know me, you know, cause I, I shop at the same places again and again and again. They're like, oh, is it, is it the deaf redhead? Yeah, there's not a lot of us in Riverview, Florida. So more than likely it's me. And um, they'll, they'll try their best to point like they normally would, but there's so many people who when you don't react or you don't respond, they think that you're rude or they get mad or they're trying to talk to you. You have no idea that anybody's talking at all because there's no facial indicator past their eyes and they could be doing anything under there. Um, I can't see their mouths move to even know that they're trying to communicate. That's been a barrier. The other barrier that I've had is because EDS is connected with my whole system um, because of the stress and all of the overwhelming fear and everything happening that's been so dark. I've been struggling with having flares, inflammation um, flares that have kind of taken over my body. And now with the added of COVID, there's an additional fear that if I'm having a flare, that it's not just a flare because of stress and my body freaking out, but maybe I have COVID, you know? And so you have like this, you know, the, this additional fear when my life has always already been scary. Now you have the, am I, am I not, am I going to need to go to the hospital or should I not? Are there going to be any beds available? You know, like there's, there's so many different layers, um, but those, those all culminate to highlighting the problems. And I think that that's been one of the big positives in the experience is that a lot of businesses are realizing that they can have a lot more employees working from home. So that might open the doors for more people with disabilities to get jobs because some people cannot afford to pay for transportation or they might have not have the ability to transport themselves or whatever um, that maybe now they'll have the opportunity for a job because it won't matter anymore. It's been proven that jobs can work from home. I think that also um, because the issues have been more obvious that maybe we'll take some more time to to fix some for making the world better. Um, that's, that's my hope, at least, you know, we have to start over again, might as well start with a, a good foot forward. Mm -hmm. Start now. <laughs> yeah. I also know that you've been dealing with some autoimmune issues. How have you been um, coping and managing them? Ah, uh, I, I mean, my body shuts down under stress, and I, I posted a picture, and it was right before um, the, at the start of the Black Lives Matter movement, it was right before kind of that blew up, and 
I, I made a post because my body was wigging out um, with the stress of, of everything that's going on in the world. And, and I was dealing with severe inflammation and trouble moving and trouble like even bending my fingers. I was spending a lot of time trying to soak in a tub to get any circulation back. Like I, I was freaking out. And then, you know, it was like my, my body was saying, calm down. And so I made that post because I knew that people were in a similar boat as me, that just because the world is hyper-focused on these major things doesn't mean that my personal physical it, limitations are not having their own moment. And it was difficult. It was difficult because I am a huge supporter of inclusion always. That's always been something that I've pushed for, not just because of this one moment in history that hopefully will lead to a lot more change, but because I stopped posting on my Instagram for like a week, I was getting hate mail that I didn't care about stuff like Black Lives Matter and, and just people judging again. And I was like, man, I was like... I just can't win for losing. Um, but it's, it's mostly understanding that people are lost and they're angry and they're confused. And that is a feeling I fully understand because in my body, I feel that way all the time. My body does and reacts to things in ways that I just don't understand. And I get lost and confused. But what we do next is what's going to define who we are. And it can't just be as simple as saying, I'm making a post. Like, we have to encourage and love each other always. And not just today. Like, this is gonna be a perpetual thing. I have to stop and listen to my body as it changes, as I grow, as I age. And bob and weave and, you know, and, and go with it as it is as we all can yeah many people are struggling who who have disabilities and medical conditions uh what advice would you give them um also to parents uh caregivers friends you know what how would you support them um how would you uh tell them or you know inspire them to keep moving forward um despite these hard times well, I think right off the bat, it's just a, a very simple reminder that you're not going through any of it alone. And it is okay to be overwhelmed. It is okay to be sad. It's okay to be frustrated. It's okay to be pissed off. It's okay. You don't need to shut yourself off and always be a smiley, happy person 100% of the time because that's what other people expect you to do. Allow yourself to mourn, allow yourself to be frustrated and to have those emotions, but don't allow yourself to get stuck there. You have so many amazing, beautiful, incredible people who are in the world who are in the exact same boat you are, just in their own little section of the world. And we have an opportunity to reach out to each other and to love on each other. Yeah, and no one caused this, it just happened. And it's actually yeah. something that I, and you've met my mom and my dad, but something that I always bring up to my mom because sometimes she gets really upset that, you know, her life has changed at X age. And, you know, I keep telling her, you know, this just happened, we're all in this together. And so. Yeah, everybody's life just changed. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So we're what better time topic. for us to come together? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Many people in our community um, are very interested and would be interested in knowing about No Barriers USA, which yeah. you are an ambassador for. So can you tell us a little bit about No Barriers USA? Yeah, so uh, No Barriers is, or I did 
barriers and then tossed it away. I kind of made up that home sign name for it. But No Barriers is a nonprofit organization that help people with and without disabilities overcome obstacles. And mostly they are there as kind of like a foundation of, of changing your, your thinking through. So um, for me, they made me understand, you know, how how to move through these difficult times, how to create a vision of what I want to do for myself, you know, and how I want to live my life and actually how to get there and, and how to harness the best parts of me while also providing a huge community of people to push and motivate you and hold you accountable as you go through those steps. One beautiful example is a friend of mine named Kyle Maynard. He was born with a specific um, barrier where he was born without his arms or his legs. And he was inspired by Eric Weinmeier, who is one of the co-founders of No Barriers. And he wanted to climb mountains. So he came to a No Barrier Summit and in a hundred percent no barriers fashion we all sat you know they sat down together and they're like okay kyle wants to climb this mountain with us today let's figure it out and so with wrapping you know he has like um the ends of of himself they wrapped with towels and they duct taped them on and he crab walked up the mountain and then from there, you know, there was a lot of hard work and innovation to create special um, kind of like shoes for, for him so that it, it latches on and gives him spikes for like icy, you know, mountains. He's done like Mount Kilimanjaro. He was featured in a um, Nike commercial um, during the Super Bowl. So that, that it's, it's people who dig their heels in and are innovative because they want each other to be successful. And so they just do an incredible job. Um, and there's so many stories, there's just thousands of them. But if you're interested in, in learning more, you can always go to uh, nobarriersusa.org. And uh, yeah. They also do, because uh, I actually spoke with Eric's father recently. Ed. Uh, yes, he's, he's lovely. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, they, in lieu of, uh, you know, the pandemic, you know, every year they do a, uh, three a summit, day summit um, experience. And this year it was done online. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah. So the, the normal summit would is it's like a, a fully inclusive experience. So you have people of all different backgrounds and there's all these different activities that you can do and they are all adaptive to whoever and whatever the need is. So um, you'll see like kids who are double amputees learning how to shoot uh, a crossbow or go swimming um, or all these different things. But uh, having a virtual summit was very difficult because a lot of those activities are in person. So what they did is they asked a lot of amazing friends and, and allies um, to be a part of this virtual summit. You had John, who's a blind painter. Um, Eric, of course, I was there. Marley Matlin was there. Uh, J.R. Martinez was there. All these incredible people um, who either performed or spoke or taught a class or a workshop. And uh, they had ASL interpreting and captioning available for everybody and then um, kind of customized things for other people. So the videos had um, audio description for blind and they did a quasi summit um, that actually opened the door and had 
thousands more people than had ever been able to go to an actual live summit. So I think this will start a change for them in the future. I think that they will have like one in person, but there'll always be the virtual summit with it now. So that if you can't physically leave your house, you can still be a part of something that's super inspirational and encouraging and maybe will change your perception of yourself, but also change your perception of what you're capable of. Yeah, sure. What is your universal message that you'd like to convey to everyone that has um, some type of difference or disorder or um, is affected in some way, whether it be a parent, um, even a professional, um, to really um, keep moving forward despite their differences and, um, you know, try to reach their um, dreams and aspirations? Yeah, I think the one phrase that I'm known for is saying, always remember to try. Um, it's not based off of saying, always try. Um, but it's, it's reminding you that you have the option. And you should remember that option exists. I think that no matter what your barrier is, whether it's obvious, invisible, or different every day, that you have two options. You can stay and do the same thing that you're doing every day and you'll know exactly what the result will be. Or you can stand up off the floor and try something and see what happens. Like you're opening the door for possibilities in your life. And the only people who can determine how far you can go is you. Great words. Now we have some questions from our community members. Yeah. <laughs> and they have, they have some great questions. Uh, the first one is, how do you cope with um, not having uh, hearing? Uh, specifically because before the age of 18, you, you had your hearing. Uh, so you talk a lot about, you know, being very encouraged and being very grateful and having a lot of great support. And that's kind of how that, how you carry on and, um, yeah. help. um, but you know, from an outside picture as well, like, you know, not every day is that exciting as we've spoken about. So, yeah. um, and there are people that are, you know, don't have a difference that you interact with. So how do you cope with that? I think you take it every day. I, initially, having such a huge change to my life was a giant shock and one that I needed to process. Um, I had to learn sign language and learn how to wake up in the morning to a, a vibrating uh, alarm clock or, um, you know, feeling safe when I'm walking in the dark. You know, there's so many things that changed. However, um, there comes a point where you start to understand that this is my life and I'm going to live it. And so now I have spent so much time loving who I am and just how I experience life. I think everybody is expecting me to be like a ball of sadness all the time because I can't hear in the way that they do when in reality sometimes I'm sad for them because they can't experience the world the way that I get to experience it. Mm -hmm. We're all living our lives the best that we can. Stop, stop putting me in a pity bubble. I don't, I don't want to live there. I'm happy. I'm happy with who I am. That's happy. Good. And you know, a lot of people with disabilities, um, myself included, you know, uh, and I was born with mine, so I don't know what it, what it's like on the other side. I mean, you acquired yours at 18. Um, mm. But regardless, it's a gift to society in so many ways. And, you know, again, myself included, I mean, I think it's, you know, crazy. And it's unfortunate that people sometimes, you know, feel too much pity when in reality, yeah. like we're all living our lives and, you know, we're happy. You know, obviously that's not the case with every single person who has- Or every happy. day, you know. Or every day, right. Um, but, you know, give or take, you know, we're just running with it. 
now. Yeah. I like when you wake up in the morning and you look at yourself in the mirror, you see you, you don't see, Oh, I'm this person, the broken person. Like you're like, hi, it's me. Let me put yeah. on my makeup. <laughs> you know, but, yeah. it's just another day. Yeah. Another party quote unquote. <laughs> um, we got also a question asked by um, someone from a company that works with uh, musicians who have uh, hearing loss. And uh, they were curious to know um, what tips or words of advice would you give to these musicians? I, I have a lot of things to say. Um, let's say start with a balloon. Blow up a balloon and hold it in your fingers and either speak, make noise, or if you don't have the ability to speak, have, have a noise hit the balloon. That could be like the radio or, or play a CD and feel the music on your fingertips. And as you do that, you become more sensitive to the vibrations that are around you. You'll be more perceptive. And um, it's a beautiful reminder when you feel lost that everybody feels music first that's the truth those waves hit your body and you are experiencing music exactly like everybody else we're feeling it first we just get to pay attention to it a little bit differently but i could go into a whole monologue about visual tuners and feeling vibrations and but uh i'm sure you can find me talking about that on the internet somewhere else you definitely can. I've definitely come across that. <laughs> yeah. uh, our last question from our community um, members was, or uh, is, um, how uh, do your virtual concerts right now keep you connected um, to your community, community and your fans? For me, I like to have um, the virtual concerts, and when they when they're playing them, um, I have found that there's a couple of different ways to go about that. With Zoom, uh, I can see people. And I like to have like moments where we can sign together and to see people of all different ages, all different backgrounds, moving and doing something together as a team. It's quite a beautiful thing. Even some of my friends who are blind, I've tried to be overly descriptive and you can see them signing along and, and feeling like they're part of of my culture now and and my way of communication but we all see each other doing it so we all feel like we're connected with something like a Facebook live I've liked doing um, the like Facebook premiere where I can have it captioned and then it's posted and it's live to everybody but I'm not physically there I've already finished it that day and I've captioned it, but then I can be messaging people the whole concert through and be an active presence of talking to each other, not just doing a concert, shutting it off, and then the next day reading the comments and hopefully having time to respond. I can be right there live in the moment. Um, it's, it's so cool to be able to do like Instagram live or Facebook live and see like the little hearts pop up and the little comments pop up right then and then and be able to respond and react to them myself and to know on either side, we're in it together. One crazy, beautiful thing. Um, in early June, I spoke for a school district and did, um, a talk. And so everybody was on their Zoom, on their Zoom all over the place. Mm -hmm. And they were all shut off, so I couldn't see them. And I would ask questions like, how many people know the song Over the Rainbow before I taught them how to sign it? And there's a feature where people can raise their hand. And you see like hundreds of hands just being raised. And so it was like, I think it was a beautiful moment because even though I couldn't see them signing with me, I could see them being a part of it and they could see themselves being a part of it with other people. I think finding different ways to be innovative with creating that community aspect is something that is always going to be incredibly important for me, but also something that I fight for. And uh, I'm hoping that that becomes an industry standard across the board because COVID is difficult 
I think the most difficult is that we're disconnected from each other. It's true. And it's, it's like you said, it's these avenues that really uh, keep us connected. And, you know, specifically mentioning Facebook Live, we're going to be doing a Facebook yeah. Live um, together this Saturday. I'm very excited. Uh, so, you know, it make, like I said, it makes sense and um, it's important. And we're so thankful that we get all these uh, different platforms and, you know, yeah. revamp the way of, you know, your industry and the way of living. Uh, so again, it's amazing. Yeah. Lastly, since I know many people are going to want to know, um, how do we stay connected with you and follow you? Aww. Um, you can find me at www.mandyharveymusic.com or you can find me on Facebook, Mandy Harvey Music, or Instagram, Mandy Harvey. I'm here, there, and everyone. If you want to be a part of my mini concerts every Friday. You can visit Patreon slash Mandy Harvey. You'll find me or you'll find that link on my Instagram. I'm everywhere. Yes, Come on, well. join the fun. <laughs> of course. Well, I'll just say in closing, it's, um, clearly we're going to do Facebook live and whatnot, but it's an yeah. honor to, um, to know you and for you to be a part of our community.